um, I wanted to talk about the placebo effect. And originally, I planned to talk about it in a very general sense, right, right across how it affects our culture and our personality. But um, I realized I was being too ambitious and was going to spend three hours of, uh, of, of your time to do that. So um, I'm going to narrow it down a bit. Um, but I also thought I should make, put at least in the philosophical context, I'll raise what would seem to be a philosophical question at the start, which is, can false beliefs be good for you? Um, and uh, Peter's already said uh, he hopes the answer is yes, but I think we'll, you'll all realize that it might not be, um, or it might be both yes and no, as we'll, as we'll see. Um, so uh, a year ago, there was a year and a half ago, there was a conference in Cambridge on, on false belief, um, which I was invited, and Petter Johansson was also there, and Horace Barlow uh, sent around an email at the beginning of it, which reads, as you can see, um, he said, many now hold that reason and logic, based on well-tested evidence, provide the best means for reaching reliable decisions, and that they should replace beliefs based on faith, intuition, or tradition that are inflexible and contradicted by the available evidence. That's hardly controversial to say that. Um, but clearly what he's implying is that uh, being irrational or holding on to false beliefs is damaging to your health. And um, I think that's, it's clear that that must, in general, be the case. I mean, false beliefs can certainly be comforting. I mean, to believe that you're, someone hasn't died when they have, for example, for a time would obviously make you uh, feel better about the world you lived in, or uh, you can just have a lucky break with a false belief if you pray and are given a, 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 a number in a dream and it turns out to be the number which is required to win the lottery, then clearly you know, you've, you've, you've benefited from what was clearly, again, a false belief. But it's hard to see how false beliefs could systematically be adaptive, that in general it could be a good thing to be believing uh, against the evidence or against logic. And that's why the placebo effect uh, does seem to be such a surprise. Um, the placebo effect, I'm sure I don't need to remind you what I'm talking about here, um, what I mean is that when pe people are administered sham medicine, either in the form of pills which have no pharmacological effects or, or, or in, in terms of being given advice from somebody who doesn't really know what they're talking about or given just false information about the safety of a situation, all those things can, it seems, have dramatically uh, rewarding uh, uh, effects on, on people. Um, you, you, they really do have, can produce miracle cures from certain illnesses. Um, there's, there's both a lot of anecdotal evidence and now a great deal of, of systematic laboratory study. For example, a study of, of swelling after wisdom tooth extraction a few years ago. Um, it wasn't a study of the placebo effect, it was a study of the effect of ultrasound on the swelling. And what the researcher did was to, uh, he found that ultrasound made the swelling go down. But he wanted to calibrate the amount of ultrasound which would work best in reducing the swelling. So he had different groups of patients. One received a high level of ultrasound, a lower level, and none at all. Um, the group which did best were the ones which had the ultrasound actually turned off. Um, so <laughs> uh, if anything, the, the real ultrasound was having a negative effect, but nothing at all. Uh, in this medical context was having a dr dramatic effect on the, how the patient responded. Um, it's, it's, it's big stuff, this. It's, uh, it's now been cl it's clear that, that uh, sham surgery, for example, placebo, placebo surgery, can be effective in a lot of cases. Dramatic evidence came of how osteoarthritis of the, of the knee can be, can be cured uh, by, by fake uh, surgery in which the patient only thinks the, the skin is in size, but no, nothing's actually done. I can give you an example from my own case. I, I had a very bad uh, pinched nerve in my neck last year and was in great pain for several months and eventually um, uh, was put through this quite dangerous procedure of an epidural injection under CAT scan to, to get very close to the nerve to, 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 to anesthetize it. Um, and uh, after two of those apparently risky injections, it was completely cured. And when I went to see the consultant afterwards, he said, well, that's, that's wonderful, but I have to tell you that I've just read a meta-analysis of the, of the research on this, and it shows that it's entirely a placebo effect. Um, placebo injection would have worked just as well. Um, so... Uh, 
it's, uh, it, as I say, the, you know, these things are, are obviously dramatic and, uh, and, and relevant to our lives, but nonetheless very puzzling. And they've certainly had a long history. Um, the, it's now reckoned that Stonehenge um, was actually a place where people went to get miracle cures. Um, as we would have to say, I think placebo cures. Uh, people went and... T we know that now from the archaeology, which has shown that there were camps around Stonehenge uh, 3,000 years ago in which a surprising number of cripples and ill people were there. The only explanation seems to have been that they'd come to Stonehenge as a hospital. And in fact, that tradition persisted um, right through the Middle Ages. There's a poem by uh, the, the, the 13th century poet Lyoman who said explicitly about Stonehenge, the stones are great and magic power they have. Men that are sick fare to that stone, and they wash that stone, and with the wa that water bathe away their, sick their sickness. They, they wash, pour the water over the stone and then wash themselves in that water. Um, so uh, people have known about it. They haven't known, wouldn't have called it placebo, but they've known about the miracles that can be worked by, by, by faith, in a way, belief in, a, in, 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 in a possibility of cure for a very long time. And... Um, Today I want to both offer a theory of what's going on here um, and then to see what it actually has, when we've discovered what's going on, what it actually might have to say about uh, beliefs and about whether beliefs that are false can really be good for you um, uh, or not. Um, and in, I'm actually going to end up by uh, arguing that, that the placebo effect is not a counterexample to the idea that, that false beliefs uh, are bad for you. I'm going to argue that actually either belief in the placebo effect or this placebo cure is not always a good thing. It actually could be a bad thing. Or alternatively, that the belief you hold isn't actually false. Um, but I'll come back to that and uh, other issues too. <coughs> now, to start off, I'm, I'm, as I mentioned yesterday, I tend to think about things in evolutionary terms. I, don't always use the term evolutionary psychologist because it's been given a lot of, lot of bad press, but I think for psychologists and for, in fact, for biological scientists in general, we must always approach things by trying to think how they came into existence over the last course of the last few million years of our evolutionary history. And obviously, from if the placebo effect is a surprise from the point of view of rationality, it's an even greater surprise from the point of view of, of evolution because... Um, it's clearly uh, people are, uh, are getting better under their, uh, uh, under their own, uh, by, by their own efforts. A placebo cure is self-cure. That's what the remarkable thing about it. When someone gets better under the influence of a sham medicine, they're, ma they're making themselves better. But if they can do that, here's the evolutionary paradox, um, if people have the capacity for self-cure, then why don't they just get on with it um, as soon as they need it if they're sick? Um, why wait for permission from a pill or a doctor or whatever it might have been in the days before medicine came on the scene? You'll see that you'd think you know, evolution would have, would, have, would have got around this. It's a very clumsy way of thing to do, to go about this roundabout route to, to producing a, a, a cure. Now, uh, it's... I think we, we might uh, begin to think about this by realizing that actually even this, if this does seem puzzling, it's not a unique case. Um, there are actually rather a lot of parallels in, 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 in our lives and in the world we live in um, where we find that surprisingly uh, people are withholding resources which you might think they would be better to be using when they can. For example, it's well known that when athletes are running a marathon, they can reach the end of the, end of the race um, and then they collapse from fatigue. But actually, physiologically, um, they still have a significant amount of reserves left in their body, uh, 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 literally held in reserve, even at the end of the race, when psychologically uh, they're finished. Um, to take another example, uh, it's unfortunately well known from research on car accidents that people die in car accidents because they haven't pushed the brakes hard enough. Um, they, 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 when they should be stamping on the brakes to, to, to stop the collision, they actually hold something in reserve. They never push them right down, um, which is what's led Mercedes-Benz to develop an a, a, a engineering system called uh, a brake assist, which actually makes sure that if you push the brakes sufficiently hard, then the servo takes over and, and 
slams it right on. And in fact, that's uh, been a significant safety measure because people themselves don't actually use the resources they've got. Or to take a, another example from a completely different field, um, we know, that, for example, that for 25 years now, the Japanese have like, economy has been in, in depression because Japanese refused to spend their savings. Um, now, if only they'd spend them, they'd, uh, the economy would have, would, have, would have revived a long time ago, but they don't. Um, so what's going on? What can be the point of not using your resources when you could? Well, with the examples I've just given, I think the point is, is actually fairly obvious. Um, sorry. Um, um, it's, it's that, that uh, you don't want to, you want to play safe. Um, if, it's, if the future is uncertain, you don't want to use up everything you've got because there could be some new threat just around the corner. Um, for example, when you reach the end of the marathon in a natural world, perhaps not in, 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 in London, um, there could be still a lion waiting for you when you get to the end of the, uh, of the, of the, of the course, and then you might have to start up all over again. Um, or when the economy is in a bad state, you it may be that you're going to be unemployed or, uh, and therefore you therefore actually can't afford to, to risk your savings and you ha have to hold on to them, even if that's actually only making things worse. But healing would seem to be a different case. I mean, it doesn't, it's not at all obvious immediately why you should withhold your healing resources, your immune system, for example, or you shouldn't get rid of the pain or whatever it might be when you could. Um, Except that I think we can see even there why uh, it might be the case. Um, uh, sorry, that's not the right one. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, yeah, sorry. I was going to say this is, of course, the, on, in relation to withholding resources. I, we, we all know the parable of the wise and foolish virgins when the, 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 the wise the wise virgins held on to their oil um, until the bridegroom came, and then he was late, and by that time the 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 foolish virgins had used up all their oil and they didn't have any left in reserve. Um, so you, you see the foolish virgins over on the right uh, uh, weeping about their, their mis mistake. Well, um, come back again to why should, why should this be, why should one do the same with, in relation to healing? Well, I think the answer, we can see what the answer has to be um, and then we'll see why it could be like that. It must, if we do hold on to our resources, it must be that immediate cure, whatever cure means, is actually not in our own best interests always. Um, and it must also be that then that the decision we make or our body makes as to how far and how fast to proceed towards cure must be taken in the light of some other information, presumably other information we're getting from the environment. Um, and thirdly, that in, in relation to placebo medicine, in particular, that medical attention or the prospect of it must constitute one among other signs that it is in <coughs> fact safe for self-cure to go ahead. But how, would we, how should we make sense of this? Why should immediate cure not always be in the person's best interest? Well, uh, I'm, I'm sure you'll guess immediately why in some cases it might not be. Many of the things, the symptoms of illness, many of the things we consider to be illness, fever, nausea, pain, for example, are actually not illnesses in their own right. They're defenses. They're, they're, they're adaptive measures we take in order to stop us getting sick in other, much more serious ways. Um, the, the pain, of course, is a, way of so is a way of protecting us from further injury when we've already damaged ourselves. Um, Nausea is a way of making certain that we eject from our body uh, potentially toxic or, or dangerous substances. Fever, by raising our blood, our blood temperature, we actually, although it, makes, you know, it weakens us and it's expensive, expensive in terms of energy, it is actually a very effective way of killing microbes um, and, uh, and bacteria. So it's, the, it's clear that the defenses we have are sometimes ones which um, we wouldn't want to to, to let down and to, and to and cure ourselves of immediately because they're there for a purpose and we're not going to cure ourselves and we're not going to get lift, lift, take, lift the guard until we have really rather good reason to do so. Um, and the uh, same is the case with the immune system. It's, you might think, well, we should deploy the immune system as soon as we can because that's going to be a good thing. But um, 
immune resources are very expensive. Um, it's, it uh, costs us to mount an immune defense. In fact, um, when if humans are even mildly sick and their immune system is active, their metabolism goes up by 15%. It's quite energetically expensive to use your immune resources. Um, and what's more, you then have to replace them by having access to the right diets and so on. So you actually want to be rather careful about using your immune system unless and until you know it's safe to do so. Um, and uh, uh, I'll give some other examples of these further on, but since I'm lecturing to a philosophical audience in, in a rather venerable place, I thought I might mention two uh, ancient Cambridge philosophers, um, they both of them look a bit like Puffendorf, um, who uh, made some of these points a long time ago, though 50 years after Puffendorf lived. Here's William Derham uh, remarking, uh, very perceptive uh, right back then, and no less kind than admirable is this contrivance of man's body, that even its distempers, he means its illnesses, should many times be its cure, to which purpose even pain itself is of great and excellent use. Um, and Nehemiah Grew, shortly uh, actually before that, said, um, nor are diseases themselves useless, for the blood in a fever, if well governed, like wine upon the fret, discharges itself and, itself and all heterogeneous mixtures whereby that which threatens death tends, in conclusion, to the prolonging of life. So these uh, 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 philosophers clearly uh, recognize that actually the illness, what we call illness, is actually not something we want to cure ourselves of immediately. Uh, the illness itself is often going to be uh, the means of, of, of maintaining health or, or stopping things getting worse. Um, and uh, so I want to say, well, yes, it does make sense to, to husband your resources and to be very careful how you deploy your, your defenses and when you use your immune system and, and, and engage in other sorts of, of expensive uh, actions which could lead rather rapidly to cure because you need to be more careful than that. And I've been thinking about this in a much more general context in relation to what I've called um, the natural health management system. Um, which I see as an evolved system within mammals, humans, but many other animals as well, for managing our resources. A very ancient system, <coughs> something that certainly didn't originate with us. This is, it's now actually got its own entry on Wikipedia, though I didn't, I didn't put it up there. Um, there's a shaman, I suppose, there's someone who's acting as a witch doctor and, um, and uh, in, inducing placebo effects. Um, so what this health management system does, I think, is it does a kind of economic analysis um, of just what the opportunities and costs for self-cure might be, what resources are available, um, how dangerous the situation is right now, um, what predictions you can make about what's going to come next, I mean, whether there are more emergencies down the way or well, whether you can be relatively safe and so on. So what, in fact, happens is, I, as I've drawn out the system, um, you take in environment, uh, environmental information of some sort, whatever it might be relevant, signs of, of injury or detection of pathogens and future risk of infection and so on, see what energy reserves you've got, whether there's medical assistance available, um, what the weather and season are, what kind of other threats might be operating, and so on. And on that basis, all this intelligence you gather, um, rather like a weather forecasting station, you take in you know, different aspects, different dimensions of... of of what's relevant to your situation, and indeed you perform uh, a health forecast. Um, and on that basis, uh, you then decide how to use your, your, your healing resources, um, how much pain to use, what, whether or not to, 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 to vomit or to hold it down or, or to develop a fever or to use your immune resources, or to engage in behaviors, uh, of sickness behaviors, like resting or seeking out help and so on. Um, and so what this health management system is, is, is basically it's like a good hospital manager. It has to choose if and when to throw resources uh, against this or that problem and how much to hold back and uh, to decide if it's essential to build up reserves in this area or that. And basically to try and produce an optimal solution to the problem of maintaining health down the line. Um, well, in other words, meet the immediate challenges, but to make sure you've got enough reserve to cope with later. And this is a very sophisticated system. Um, it's, uh, 
it, just recently, I may, may say that, that physicians and, and uh, immunologists have begun to think in terms of a behavioral immune system. But I think I, I was probably the first to put forward this idea that evolution has set us up to be, to be health forecasters like that and so to uh, make optimal decisions. And let me just give you a few examples of how it works. Um, uh, let's take the case of pathogen detection. You detect some, some uh, bacterium, for example, and you're going to make an immune response. Well, as I said, the immune response is expensive. It's, uh, it's energy, it's costly, it's, it's also um, uh, it means you have to build up rare nutrients and so on afterwards. So you only want to do it when, in fact, you're safe to do so. Um, and if it's bad weather or cold, or it's in fact, if it's winter, for example, it might be not such a good idea to use your immune resources because you're not going to be able to replace them uh, very quickly. And indeed, experiments have now been done. Well, we've been some in, in evidence from humans, but in, in animals, in which, for example, when hamsters, uh, hamsters, the two groups of hamsters are kept on different day night cycles, one of which makes the hamsters think that it's winter and the other makes them think it's summer. Um, okay? In winter, there's comparatively longer periods of darkness. And then you inject these uh, hamsters with, with, a, with a bacterium and make them sick and see what happens. Well, if they think it's summer, they mount a full-scale immune response um, and they get better within a few days. Uh, if they think it's winter, they mount a holding operation. They, they do use some of their immune resources, but they don't make themselves better. They just make sure that they don't get worse. But basically, it looks as if they're holding on because it's winter, and in fact, there may be more infections to come. And anyway, they can't afford to, to, uh, to they haven't got, they're not going to have the energy to replace their, their, or to be able to afford that immune response. Um, equally, uh, if, if it's okay, so the, the result of, of it seeming to be winter is the immune response goes down. But equally, um, if it seems to be uh, things looking good, um, then uh, you can afford to, to, to in fact, to, sorry, uh, to increase your immune response. And again, lots of evidence from humans for this. That, for example, not just the actual season of the year and so on, but just what you see out of the window makes a big difference. Um, hospitals if you have a room with a view out onto parkland and trees um, and you hear the birds singing and so on, then your recovery from the rate at which your wounds heal after an operation, in fact, is considerably faster. Uh, can, that can be twice as fast as if you have a view out of the window onto a brick wall. Um, uh, Again, uh, this is, was news to hospital managers when it, they, it was first described, but of course they're beginning to realize it, that actually what people think about where they are makes a big difference to how they use their healing resources. Um, I'll give you some more examples. I think these are all rather interesting. Um, if, it's, if you have reason to think that you might get reinfection, then again, your immune response will go up because you, you actually need to, you, you, I mean, if you, in the presence of a, a pathogen, of further pathogens, you want to make sure that you're, you're protected. And that can also occur with s seeing other people who are sick. Um, a very interesting new experiment has just been done to show that uh, in humans, seeing other sick people produces a dramatic immune response, even if you're not sick yourself. Um, this is, I should say, these are when you're not sick yourself and you're deciding whether or not to, to deploy your immune resources at all. Here's the experiment. They, they, um, uh, showed two different groups of people two kinds of threatening slides. Um, one is actually obviously very threatening, the guy with the gun. The other is only potentially threatening if you're thinking in terms of, 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 of health management in some way. But, and then they looked at the immune response of the subjects in the next uh, 20 minutes or so after seeing these, these pictures. Um, the picture on the left is the response in saliva. It's a measure of the number of white cells in the saliva which are indicate the immune response. In response to the gun, it's, it's uh, very mildly raised. In response to seeing somebody else, a foot picture of someone else coughing, it's, it's dramatically raised. Um, so but we're using intelligence. We're trying to take account of what might be uh, about to happen. Uh, and it looks as if the, the uh, health management system also takes account of rather more nebulous factors too. Um, 
omens and threats and so on coming even through, uh, through religious beliefs or through uh, or, or, or superstitions. Um, for if you have belief that you're, that you're cursed in some way, for example, um, it can actually decrease your immune response. And uh, a famous study has shown that in Chinese Americans, um, they're not in Caucasians, they die significantly earlier, uh, up to five years earlier, if they have a combination of a disease and a birth year that, according to Chinese astrology, would be particularly uh, ill-fated. Um, for example, if you're born in one of the earth years um, and you have uh, cancer, lymphatic cancer, you die four years earlier uh, if you have, have believed in the system. Whereas if you were born in a metal year uh, and have lung disease, you die four year, five, year, five years earlier. Whereas, of course, if you have metal and cancer, uh, then it doesn't seem to be a bad combination. Um, and interestingly enough, these are done in, in America, these, these studies, and it, they had controls of those who believed strongly in Chinese astrology and those who didn't. The ones, it was the ones who believed most strongly who showed the greatest effects, were more likely to be susceptible to these, to these omens, um, in which, which uncontrollable, of course, the year they were born in. And um, I suspect that if we, I mean, we, we don't have the same kind of belief in, in omens that the Chinese do uh, in, in, in the Western world, but I, we have some other strange beliefs. Um, I think the study's not yet been done amongst uh, people living in, in Britain or, 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 or in Sweden. I don't know the extent to which people follow astrology in Sweden, but in Britain, everybody reads their astro astrological charts. Um, and I suspect that people who are unlucky enough to have the star sign, the sun sign of cancer, I suspect that you'd find that they're more likely to die of cancer. Nobody's ever looked at that yet. What they have looked at is something rather simpler, which is just to look at people's initials or um, uh, the initials of their names. Um, here's some very surprising results. Um, <laughs> This is mortality uh, as related to, to, to the initials of, um, uh, of, 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 of the subject. And you'll see that, uh, I mean, it's not entirely consistent, but still it's a very strong effect. If you have, if you have uh, bad names, DTH, SAD, RAT, and so on, um, you actually, you end, you know, your lifespan may be 20 years less um, than if you happen to be, be, have the initials LIV or LOV. Um, it's... Uh, these are, are strange and, and, and remarkable effects, and um, I'm, uh, what, what, what the point I'm making is that, that how we use our resources is clearly a very complex and, uh, matter. It's subject to a variety of influences, some of which actually do make sense um, in terms of how we ought, to, if we're, if, if we're, we're well designed, to be, to be deploying our, uh, our defences and our immune responses and so on, others, others of which, like this one, are clearly a mistake. Um, uh, but nonetheless, we can see the route by which they might be working. So um, let me come particularly to the question of placebos. And I'm going to actually take the case now of, of pain. Um, and uh, why I want to ask what, if you have damp, you know, pain receptors of signaling or in, in pain, what's going to uh, f f help you overcome that pain. And I want to distinguish three ways in which the pain might be reduced. And I'll call them pharmacological analgesia, uh, natural analgesia, and placebo analgesia. Um, the first doesn't involve the evolutionary health management system, but the second two do. But I'll, I'll, you'll see why I want to bring in the first one as well. What I mean by pharmacological analgesia is just giving a, a drug which is directly uh, acting uh, on, on the, either the, the, the information you're getting or, as we'll see, on the output. Aspirin, for example, actually blocks the reception of these signals from the, from the body, surface of your body, so you just don't know that you're in pain, uh, that there's any injury any longer, and, of course, then the pain goes down. But equally, you can do it at the other end of the... Uh, of, of the, uh, on the on the output side with a drug like morphine. What morphine does is actually to block the actual defence of pain, the, the, the psychological defence in your in your brain, um, and so uh, again, of course, the pain goes down. But um, 
Now let's come, though, to how uh, this could be also controlled by information coming in about the environment. Um, and uh, what I'm going to call natural analgesia. And this is where we're responding in ways in which nature has designed us to, because it turned out to be highly adaptive to do this. Um, basically, if you're in pain, um, you need to take account of a variety of things, but in particularly uh, whether you're going to, there's someone there to look after you, whether you're going to have others to, uh, to, to manage for you, to take care of you, to nurse you, and so on. If you are, you can afford to feel less pain. Um, it's only if you're really on your own uh, and you're going to have, you're, 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 it's entirely up to you that you're going to uh, have to be extremely careful about um, how you uh, act if, if you're feeling pain because you really can't afford to take a risk. Um, so that um, if things are looking good, then, then again the pain's going to, going to go down. Um, signal might be a traditional one that mum is here and she's patting you on your shoulder and uh, fine again the pain can go down. Or that the doctors there, uh, perhaps even stronger effect than, than, than mummy's pet caressing hand. Um, I've asked doctors about this, by the way. Um, my own G GP, um, I s asked him how often do patients, having waited in your waiting room in the surgery, uh, come in and say, oh, doctor, this is awfully embarrassing, but actually the symptoms have gone. <laughs> um, I did have this pain, um, I was feeling sick, but I'm not now. And he said, the doctor said, well, actually it happens all the time. <laughs> um, just seeing the doctor, uh, anticipating the doctor, can make the symptoms go down, which is perhaps a good reason for the British Health, National Health Service, which has very long waiting times in the, in the surgery while you're waiting to see the doctor. Um, so that's a positive effect of waiting rooms. Um, but... Um, Here's some other interesting information that, um, uh, well, of course, this, this is a case of the real medicine is going to, the prospect of it's going to help put the pain go down even before it actually works. But here's an interesting case just come out in the literature. If you look at your hand when it's being hurt, pinched or given an electric shock or whatever, um, the pain is considerably less than if you can't see it. Um, you know, nurses often when you're giving a jab say, ask, ask you to look. It actually feels less than if you uh, are getting it unexpectedly and you can't see what's going on. Well, why might that be? It's because actually, if you can see your hand and in this experimental situation, you can see that actually there's nothing wrong. That um, Then again, you don't, you don't need to t take so much account of the, of the, uh, the stimulus. Um, and uh, here's an experiment which has done that. Actually, what this did was... Um, Here's where you can't see your hand, um, and that's the pain threshold from, it actually was a heat stimulus, um, and this is what's just bearable. Um, it's, when it's, you can't see your hand, you find it unbearable at a lower temperature. When you can, you can take more heat. Um, and interesting enough, in this experiment, they actually had magnifying uh, apparatus, which made you see your hand e even larger than it was, or slightly smaller than it was. Turns out the bigger your hand looks, the safer you feel about it if you can see there's nothing wrong. Um, but if you, uh, there is something wrong, I mean, for, if you actually see there's injury, then actually it has, the effect is the opposite, the pain goes up. Uh, again, I give you my own, maybe you'll have your own examples of this, I'm sure, but I remember as a, a small boy falling out of a tree in our, in our garden at home um, and landing on my head, and in fact, on some bricks and pulling myself together, um, and I'm a bit giddy, but it's, I stood up and then I saw my father running towards me, looking uh, uh, absolutely terrified. Um, and then I looked down and I saw I was just covered in blood. Um, and at that point, it began hurting. <laughs> it hadn't hurt at all up to, up to that, before that. So uh, here's another example when I had other information that this was much more serious than I had first taken it to be, um, then indeed the pain was considerably increased. But, as I said, it's, it's very complicated which way this is going to go. I saw my father's frightened face. It made me feel worse. If it had been a case of my father saying, Nick, just forget it, the house is on fire, or not, not, it's in, it's in the garden, or there's a wolf uh, uh, just behind you, then um, actually w what happens is that the pain goes down, because that's the case where you really can't afford to, um, you can't afford to let pain just... Um, uh, interfere with your, the only thing which is going to save your life. And, of course, we know of many cases where people under extreme duress stop feeling pain at all because if they did, 
it's the, 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 the lives are going to uh, uh, terminate, terminate quite quickly. It happens with animals too, um, that under great stress they will apparently act as if they're no, no pain when they've been you know, predators on their, uh, on their back, let's say. Or for, exa for example, a horse won the derby a few years ago with a broken leg, um, but this whole um, stress of the event was so great that in fact it seems not to have felt any pain at all. So these are all what I call natural analogies. We've been ad we're adapted to take account of this kind of information. It really makes sense, um, and uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a useful uh, thing to do. But information is just information, um, and of course it can be, uh, it can, it can be sub the system can be subverted by false information, um, false inform or reading the environment and thinking we've got, we're getting signals which don't mean what they do. Um, and uh, that's, I'm going to come on to the case of placebo analgesia, because I think that's just what placebos are. Um, they are providing false safety signals. Now, I mentioned that, of course, aspirin provides, it's giving you a false signal. Um, it's, it's making you think you're you're not in pain when you are. He said there's no injury when there is. But uh, what aspirin can do can also be done by, by uh, information, things you, uh, what you're hearing or seeing in the environment. Um, and it's going to work even when uh, that, that information is false, uh, if, even if the good news really isn't true at all. Nonetheless, you may respond by, by, by reducing your pain or, what other, or what, deploying your other health resources, or even if the doctor's a quack, or even if uh, Jesus is a figment of your imagination, uh, or even if you know, the medicine is fake but it tastes nasty like, like medicine sh should do, um, or the wolf is only a scare story. These are all going to still, uh, you'll take account of them and you'll, you'll change your healing response in, re in response to them. Um, and in this case, we're clearly de dealing with what we've traditionally called the placebo effect, though people haven't thought about it in quite those terms as just a means, as a way in which we're responding to a situation uh, as if it meant something it doesn't. Uh, and it can, of course, go the, the other way as, w as well. You may have heard of the reverse of the placebo, the nocebo, um, where you actually get worse because of false information. Well, um, and again, if you actually get false information that you're, uh, that you're damaged when you're actually not, I mean, false blood on your hand, for example, is actually likely to make the pain worse. Um, and various other uh, more important cases of, uh, we know about where people having information which leads them to believe that things are actually worse than they really are, leads them to uh, not using their immune resources or to feeling more pain or whatever it might be. Okay, so that's my model of how the placebo effect is working. Um, it's, 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 not, it's, it's not too complicated. It's, it's not magic. It's just that we are set up to respond to cues in the environment in adaptive ways. But, of course, this system can't be perfectly uh, uh, advised. And um, like any system, uh, we, we, can, we can be taken in by, uh, by illusions, basically. And that they're going to be our response will be indistinguishable from the real thing. We, all, we do know a bit about how this works, by the way, um, about how placebo response to pain works. We actually know um, how this works at the level of, of, of the pharmacology. Uh, you'll have noticed that I've, I've, I've put the response to the placebo on this side, that it's changing our output, the amount of pain we feel. It's not stopping us uh, actually sending signals into the system saying that, that we've got an injury, for example. Um, and so it's more like morphine than it is like aspirin. And we know that now because of a very interesting finding, uh, which is this, that you can block the effects of, of morphine with a drug called naloxone. Um, what naloxone does is uh, basically stops morphine working. And it means that if you've, you were in pain, you were given morphine, and you, and, and, and you, the pain had gone away, given naloxone, and the pain uh, will, in fact, uh, return. So uh, what's interesting is that the same happens with placebo effect. You uh, give someone placebo medicine, which has cured their, 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 their pain, for example, and then you give them 
naloxone. What actually happens, it's experimental finding, is that the, uh, the, 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 the pain, instead of being reduced, um, comes right back again, which makes it clear that the way our bodies are doing this is by using in, uh, the placebo effect is, means that we're changing the level of our endogenous opiates, the morphine-like substances <coughs> we actually do use to control pain. So um, it's, uh, the, this, this, it's not only now we have a kind of model which makes sense in evolutionary terms and functional terms, but we also are beginning to see how it could work at a physiological level. Okay, so what's that tell us then about uh, my opening question about uh, whether false beliefs can be a good thing? Well, at the start of the lecture, uh, I'd have assumed you'd say, just like Peter did, that yes, of course, uh, the placebo effect in particular shows that false beliefs, beliefs can be a good thing. Um, you have a headache, for example, um, and you believe that a sugar pill is a powerful medicine, and you take the pill and your headache goes away. Um, what could be a more obviously example of a, of, of a false belief being a good thing because presumably not having a headache is a good thing, or so you would have thought at the beginning of the lecture, I guess, and the belief that a sugar pill is a powerful medicine is presumably false. But I hope in the last 20 minutes I've persuaded you that we actually ought to question both those assumptions. Firstly, of course, that not having a headache is a good thing, and secondly, the belief that a sugar pill is not a powerful medicine. Um, because, let's take the first point, um, just to remind you, uh, immediate cure is not always in the person's best interest. Having a headache, uh, not having a headache, is not always a good thing. Having the headache is the better thing from the point of view of safety, if it's going to make certain that you, know, you, you take rest and, uh, and don't uh, expose yourself to whatever possible further damage you might do or, or infections or whatever it might be. Not having a headache is certainly not something which you want to uh, just throw. I mean, you want to throw away your headache immediately. Um, so we have to say that in some respects, um, if you're cured by placebo medicine, you're cured by a false sense of security into getting rid of pain which you ought to be feeling because it was in your own interests to do so, or for that matter, having a fever or whatever it is then actually the placebo effect is, is, is counterproductive. It's actually putting you at risk um, because it isn't the case that, you, you know, as it might be that, that you, 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 real security is on the way. You're, you've been taken in by, by snake oil or whatever it might be. So a uh, placebo effect can certainly be a mistake. And I think that we have to assume that um, in our evolutionary history, when our healing systems were developing and and uh, nature was making decisions about what kind of information we should take account of, then uh, nature made certain we did play safe and it would have been a very bad thing just to have got rid of the, of the headaches under the false impression or the other pains under the false impression that um, it was a good thing to do. So um, not having a headache is a good thing we might begin to question. But we also might, of course, realise that things have changed since the days that in which we evolved. Um, in the past, no doubt, it was very uh, essential to be amazingly, uh, I mean, extremely overcautious. You just couldn't risk taking uh, risks with your life and, and, and the way in which you used your conservative healing systems. Um, but we can say now that in the present world, in which actually the threats are much less serious than they were, and the possibilities of, of, of security and, 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 and um, sucker coming from outside are much greater than they are, then nature has made us, in a way, much too overcautious. Um, so while it would have been a bad thing to respond to placebos in the distant past, um, today we actually do feel more pain than we need to. Uh, we're too cautious in, in using our immune systems. We're too uh, ready to, to mount a fever or to, or to feel nausea or whatever it may be uh, when we need not to, um, which is a, very, a reason why actually placebos can be a huge blessing because they're persuading us to actually take uh, 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 action um, when our better nature might have told us not to, but actually it's a safe thing to do. So um, 
I think we can say that in the modern environment, um, placebo cure can actually be a good thing. Um, but then what about the belief that a sugar pill is a powerful medicine being false? Um, is it a false belief which is leading to this good thing? Well, again, if, if you've seen the point I've been making, you'll realize that, of course, something's false about this. The belief that the sugar pill contains a powerful medicine is certainly false. It doesn't. It just contains sugar or chalk or whatever. But the belief that the pill is a powerful medicine that's going to make you feel better, well, that could well be true, um, even if you hold it for the wrong reasons. Uh, it's true because placebos work. So the placebo pill actually is a strong medicine because it's a placebo, although you may think this is circular, but it's actually, uh, it, it doesn't take away from the truth of the fact, even if it's a self-confirming truth. Because to just to the extent that you expect a placebo medicine to work, it's going to work. Um, now, why should you expect it to work? Well, uh, it could be for the wrong reasons, that you think it's got all sorts of magical or medical or pharmacological uh, powers that it hasn't. I mean, homeopathic medicine, for example, uh, has no substance to it at all, but there's an awful lot of theory behind it which might make you believe in it. Um, but you could also believe in it just because you know that and have learned that placebo medicines actually are effective. And here's a very interesting example of this. Uh, Fabrizio Benedetti, who was the leading researcher on placebo, on, on, on pain in general, and placebo effects on pain, um, in his lab, again and again, he's injected people with placebo drugs and shown that they show, you know, they, they don't feel to the same extent the electric shocks and so, or the heat stimulus, whatever he's been giving them, th that they would do if they hadn't had the medicine. For Benedetti has seen the placebo effect occurring probably more than anyone else um, on this planet. What happens then when Benedetti uh, makes himself the subject of his own experiment um, and uh, is being given a very painful stimulus and knows that he's, he then knows, says, okay, Traps press the button and is injected with what he knows is a placebo, the pain goes away. <laughs> um, even though he actually knows uh, that the, exactly what the situation is. And I think the explanation is that he also knows, better than anyone else does, that this medicine works. Um, and so uh, it's, in a sense, not so surprising. It, it's a very important finding, this. It's also just been um, found uh, outside the lab in, in, uh, well, in a case where people um, uh, have just recently looked at the effects of administering placebos when the patient is told outright that it is a placebo. Big study of irritable bowel syndrome published a couple of months ago. Again, uh, in that case, even the patients, even when they were told that what they were getting was, had no pharmacological agency at all, but uh, the, the, the pattern was, uh, this contains nothing of medical value as such, but there's every reason to think it'll work because it's a placebo. Uh, the patients got better. Uh, it was exactly the same as the medicine which it was being tested against, even though they knew it to be a placebo. So um, uh, that's uh, obviously false, and it's a, um, at least it can be false. And um, it, it means, it, the important thing is, it means that um, actually doctors can now prescribe placebos with a good conscience. They're still not allowed to by law in, in Great Britain. I don't know what it is here, but um, there's, I think there's every reason why that law should change uh, because uh, it's, it's evidence-based medicine, this, that placebo, placebos actually do work. Um, we, know it, we also know it, of course, um, uh, logically, that in some sense we know the logic that if we believe they're going to, then, then they're going to. So here's something else to think about. If, if placebos do work, um, and if we can know they work, um, then the whole system designed by nature to look after us might seem to be at some risk, actually. It's, it's clearly essential that we can't ourselves subvert our own health management system merely by acts of will, uh, merely by wishing that a pain would go away or wishing that we wouldn't feel uh, sick or, or that uh, the, the bacteria would stop ravaging our, our, our livers or whatever it might be. You can't allow mere wish fulfillment to, to come in here and, 
and uh, provide information which you would just like to be true. Um, if you did that, of course, the system would begin to be uh, useless to you. Um, you can't, in fact, allow yourself to, to be influenced <laughs> by what we might call complementary medicine. Um, I don't know, imagine you, this is, a, this is an English joke, but I suspect that most of you know, can see what the joke is. Um, uh, the, the guy would like to believe that everything's fine with him. Um, and indeed, um, it's, very, it's going to be very important that, um, that, we, that we, our beliefs are well founded in some way, even if they're beliefs in placebos. Um, we can't, and we can't just have beliefs uh, out of the blue. We can't have beliefs for which they, there are no reasons. Um, I mean, we actually can't have beliefs which, for which there are no reasons. So it's been a long philosophical position. They, those don't count as beliefs. We have to be able to justify, in some sense, our, our beliefs, even if we're giving false explanations. Um, Stephen Weinberg, the physicist, wrote some time ago that the decision to believe or not to believe is not entirely in our hands. I might be happier and even have better manners if I thought I were descended from the emperors of China. But no effort of will on my part can make me believe it any more than I can will my heart to stop beating. And he might have said, and no effort of will can make me cure my headache um, just because I would like it to go away. So we can assume that this health management system, our healing systems, ought to be and presumably are pretty well ring-fenced against mere wish-fulfilling beliefs, um, including the belief that I'd just like this therapy to work uh, for me. But now what if belief in placebo therapy actually isn't mere wish-fulfillment? What if, as I just suggested, it's actually evidence-based? What if, like Benedetti, you've seen it happen under your eyes or you're living in a culture where uh, you, the word gets around that these things really, really do work? And what's more, if you understand the theory and you realize that uh, if you believe it will work, it will work, and therefore logically you ought to believe in it. Um, now, this is a level of, of sophistication that which probably nature hasn't had to contend with in the past, but it does seem that there's potentially a serious loophole um, in the way in which our health systems, management systems have been set up, and that's the possibility of self-administered uh, placebo medicine. Um, and uh, as I say, it's, it may turn out to be a rather sophisticated uh, individual who's going to deploy it, um, but, uh, and Shakespeare thought that even philosophers uh, wouldn't get there. Um, <laughs> there was never yet a philosopher who could endure the toothache patiently, uh, but maybe that's just what philosophers might be best at. Um, and some of you will perhaps recognize a famous philosopher here, um, uh, Daniel Dennett, uh, in fact, practicing at becoming his own scarecrow um, to ward off illness. Um, uh, Dan was, in fact, uh, we were playing around, and Dan was imagining that, in fact, he, uh, that he could generate his own placebo effect, and that was his, um, his uh, rather dramatic reenactment of it. Um, and if Dennett could do it, why not the rest of us? <laughs> okay, thanks. <coughs> Is it working? Sir. Well, sir, I, I just uh, like to ask you, this uh, health management system, is this actually something working? Did, is it applied in, uh, in England or whatever? Is it just a kind of pattern so everybody should follow it? I, I didn't really quite oh, it's a, no, it's a, it's, you've, you, you follow it by nature. I mean, you have evolved and your ancestors evolved to use information in just these ways in order to, uh, to regulate how you how you use your own healing resources. Um, so this is not a this is not a, a, a institutional structure. It's something which is actually in your genes. Um, That's right. But this is a kind of, of uh, say paper or publication. But nobody will agree with that because you know the whole society is involved with people pain. Well, as, as a matter of fact, as a neurologist with a pain specialty. So, uh, but just in in a few words, uh, you cannot just isolate cases of, in, in, in such studies which are beautifully done and everything, but you have the whole world around somebody being in pain. In this country, in, in mostly of all the rest of the world too, you have that kind of reward by being sick, by having pain, and you cannot deal with your pain and, or 
even in that very beautiful philosophical way of taking care of yourself because you don't have have the time. Time is lacking all over the world and the (laughs) patient is not having one week to reflect about should I become uh, better next week? Do I need some rest or everything? Because he's obliged by the society (laughs) uh, around him to to define Mm -hmm. himself Mm -hmm. quick next day. Am I sick or not? I have to go to work or not, or whatever. So I mean, well, I'm going <coughs> to talk a bit tomorrow, yeah. but I'm sorry, I won't get on okay. to it now about possibility of, of nature cures for us, uh, in which are the, and often the, uh, the, the cases where we actually get out of the rat race and so on and, uh, and get into a different environment. I'm going to reserve that for now. I thought you made some several points. I thought you were going to start off started off by saying, well, actually, the medical establishment um, are going to, not going to let word get out about this. Um, well, you, if you'd said that, you'd have, you'd have been right on the ball. Uh, um, it, the fact is that uh, the pharmacological industry, and actually med doctors in general, are very nervous about the placebo effect, um, particularly when it turns out that some of the most prized and, and, and profitable drugs are no better than placebos. Irving Kirsch, the psychologist, American psychologist, recently showed that, that, that um, Prozac is 90% a, a, a placebo medicine. Um, now, that's you say, okay, only 90%, so well, maybe a little bit better if you use the real drug. Yes, but the thing is that uh, if you were given placebo Prozac, it wouldn't have the dangerous side effects which Prozac actually does, as well as not costing anything. Um, and one of the arguments Kirsch has made in particular is why placebo medicine should often be substituted, even when, often when it is equal to other medicine, but even if it's not quite as good, is because it actually doesn't have dangerous side effects. Um, I don't know how many of you know that, Pro- that Prozac has turned out to be rather a dangerous drug in a particular population, in teenagers, for example. Um, the rate of suicide amongst teenagers taking Prozac is hugely elevated. Um, so it's not a safe drug even though it works. But if you can have a placebo doing the job, you clearly should. Um, but I'll give you another anecdote about just how, uh, how, how the medical establishment's reacting. Um, a colleague of mine did research on placebos in dogs. Now, it's a very interesting case. You may have occurred to you, does this work in animals? Well, it turns out, yes, placebo medicine can work with dogs. Um, it works through the owner, of course. The owner expects the medicine to work and conveys that to the, to the dog who then adjusts its healing resources appropriately or, or its behavior. And there's a particular um, uh, drug, which, uh, clomipramine, which was used, is used widely um, in, by veterinarians to calm down dogs who are over-anxious and over-stressed and you know, whine all the time and bark when their owners are away. Um, it's, a, it's a real money spinner, particularly in the United States. Um, James Sapel did research in which he compared uh, real clomipramine with, with, with sham clomipramine. Uh, the sham worked absolutely as well as the real drug. And he sent his paper off to the veterinary record in the United States. Um, nothing happened for a couple of months. Uh, and then he wrote to the editor, who was his friend, and said, well, um, you know, what, what's happening with this paper? And got this letter back saying, well, this is very embarrassing, but I'm afraid I have to tell you that, that it was Roche, I think. Roche have said they will withdraw advertising from our journal if you publish this paper. Um, uh, and uh, what James did was actually then threaten to publish this correspondence if they didn't publish the paper. And in fact, the paper was published. But you can see you know, that they'll fight dirty, the medical establishment, if they have to. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you again. And I'm glad you mentioned Irving Kirsch. He will come here and lecture for us in a few months, in September. He's a good friend. Uh, I would like to complicate matters mm-hmm. a bit because you mentioned just wishing something will not make it so, as far, for example, as pain. But I think the way you wish it, therein lies the rub. Because speaking again of Irving and research we do here, when we use hypnosis, we actually let people know that they can do something except typically contra it, it doesn't work rationally. We are using their fantasy, mm-hmm. some other aspects, which one might say start as being false. I have a paper that's called Truthful Trickery. You start with mm-hmm. something that seems to be false, but if you believe in it enough, it becomes true. And it happens in shamanism and it happens in hypnosis, except it doesn't happen rationally. 
So I would say... Yes, I, I, I agree. You can, you can and particularly there's, it, it merges between just wishing and praying, for example. And once you pray to someone, again, I'll say a bit about this tomorrow, you're actually invoking a, 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 a loving, comforting force outside yourself, which actually, you know, again, you could mistake for the real thing, even if it's actually, uh, you might think it's, it, it's a mistaken belief and, and you'd be unwise to, 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 to treat it as if you were safe. Um, but... Um, uh, Sorry, there was something else I was going to take on that. Um, yeah, well, I was going to, yes, of course, uh, th there's been a lot of interest among philosophers about whether you can make, can come to believe things. I mean, Stephen Weinberg may not be entirely acceptable to f the philosophers here. Pascal, for example, raised this uh, very important question. I mean, having discussed the wager, for example, and proved to himself, and proved to most statisticians, I suppose, that it's actually terribly rational to believe in God, uh, because if, it's, if, if, if you're wrong about that, you're in real trouble, as if you're, if you're right, you have heaven, uh, eternal life. Um, so uh, Pascal you know, realized that actually, even if you're an unbeliever, you ought to believe. It's going to, it's, it's, it's going to help you, um, and it's the rational thing to do. But then he, he asks, well, you know, but what if I just don't believe? Um, what can I do about it? And his advice is, he says, just try. <laughs> Every day, just try believing a little more. Um, uh, and eventually you'll find you do. So just by practice, Pascal reckoned, you could actually bring yourself to a belief which you held firmly. I don't know what, what, what people think about that. Um. Uh, thanks for a very interesting talk, really. Um, I'm wondering, you've taken up quite clear-cut examples of symptoms like nausea is very obvious. Mm -hmm. Maybe I should throw up just in case. Nah, a line is chasing me, I better wait. Mm -hmm. But there are more complex situations like depression. Mm -hmm. uh, th these uh, semi-new medicines, these serotonin reuptake inhibitors? Well, Prozac is that. Is that one yeah. of those? Yeah. Okay, because they're almost entirely placebo. It yeah. seems like, like mm -hmm. there's about a 40% increase in the group that takes them compared to the group that takes sugar pills, but they all get better. Mm -hmm. It seems to be weird. What would be good for the person in maintaining depression when they in fact ah, well, have the solution? Been, there's been quite a lot of spe speculation about that. Randolph, Randolph Nessie is a psychiatrist who's written a book called, um, um, what's it called? Do you know? it's, I think it's called Darwin in Medicine it, in Britain and called Why We Get Sick in America. Um, and uh, he actually and others have speculated that about at least mild depression as being highly adaptive. It's a way of, when your life is going wrong, it's a way of s stopping you and making you just hold on and th sit down and not do anything more, to change track. It's a way of, of, of giving you the breathing space to think about alternative possible uh, strategies which you might, might actually lead to better outcomes. Um, so, uh, you know, if, if, if it worked, for example, you know, you're clearly not doing very well and so on, and, but you're locked into that situation. Depression may be an effective way of just removing you from the situation, giving you a chance to start over. Or in a relationship, it's been argued particularly, which of often is, you know, breakup of relationships or relationships going wrong are a major source of depression. Absolutely terrible for the subjects experiencing it, yet the outcome of the depression is very often the ending of a relationship and the chance to begin a new one. Um, it's been argued the very fact that depressed people are so unattractive to live with um, is highly adaptive. If you want your partner to leave you, uh, uh, just get depressed. And in fact, that may be the, the, the most effective thing to do in some circumstances. And if he stays, that may save the marriage for sure. <laughs> yeah. um, but in, in, I mean, major there's major depression as well, which is clearly a pathology, which is not adaptive at all. I mean, you know, if, if somebody can simply can't function and is suicidal, it's a, it, that's not adaptive. But you, you're getting onto the issue I might have talked about if I'd given them a much larger uh, lecture. And I've talked about the health management system there. I'm developing ideas about what I call the self-management system, in which we actually regulate all aspects of our personality um, according to a cost-benefit analysis. And so I've been looking at other aspects, not just uh, in terms of defensive symptoms and so on, of where withholding what might seem to be positive sides of ourself could actually be adaptive, um, uh, you know, not being as extrovert as we might uh, in some circumstances, because it actually leads to, 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 to poor consequences. Not being as intelligent as we might um, 
could actually be uh, uh, an adaptive thing to do. Uh, uh, you might think that, you know, how could not ha displaying intelligence actually uh, ever uh, be an advantage? Well, um, I don't think I've got the slide there. Uh, it's, it, 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 if you're in a group and you're the, you're the, you, you stick out as being, uh, you know, the, the cocky uh, know-all who can, uh, always is not only thinks he's right but is right, it actually is very disruptive to the group. Um, and uh, the United States Police Force in, in Connecticut uh, has actually got rules about recruitment that no one with an IQ over the age of, uh, over the, over, no one with IQ over 120 is thought suitable to be a member of the Connecticut Police Force. Uh, um, uh, it's, it, it sounds crazy in a way, doesn't it? But you can see how, in some circumstances, uh, you need to regulate the way you present yourself to the world or else you just won't get on with people. Um, and um, it's... Uh, I think it's true in, in relation to politics, and, it's, and uh, you, know, you, you modify just how liberal you appear, how conservative you appear, depending on the context you're in. Um, so I think we could extend this model in, in, to a lot of other aspects of human nature. And my guess would be that, nonetheless, it all began with regulating uh, health and uh, things like, uh, like fever and immune responses, because there's a, a recent evidence that even in, um, in earthworms, they actually have, no, actually, no, sorry, it's even in, it's in single-celled animals <laughs> that uh, surprisingly there, are, um, there, there seems to be environmental uh, influences on how they deploy their immune resources. Um, so it's, it has been a very long history to this. <clears throat> Uh, I have a, a, a non-philosophical but rather practical ethical question. Uh, the hospital, uh, Lund University Hospital and Malmö uh, University Hospital are fighting with a, 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 a big uh, budget deficiency and try to cut the costs. And let's imagine that I'm I'm the director or uh, head of the board and need to find out new, new ways of to cut the costs. Already the doctors here at Lund are advised not to, uh, only to prescribe cheaper copies of medicine or even actually not prescribe needed medicines at all. So uh, what should the what could, if I was to head here, what would I bring with me s to start well, I think I mean, the I think treatment the instead with self-management cure for the patient? Well, this, this, this uh, approach to it would suggest that actually the, you, you, needn't, um, you needn't put the patient's health at risk by cutting down on the amount of drugs you administer and the, and the expense of, of, of pr procedures, provided you don't take away the patient's belief that they're getting the best medicine. Um, uh, you know, they need to believe that this medicine works. Um, and it's why actually uh, uh, novel medicines often work better than, than the ones which have been around some time. It's um, just the very novelty is important. Uh, it works at even a uh, much simpler level than that. People have compared different colors of placebo pills. Um, red is by far the most effective um, in, in, in most of Europe, um, and blue is, is not so effective. Um, so in your hospital, you want to make sure that the medicine being administered is red, even mm -hmm. if it's uh, whatever uh, it's, it contains. But I'll just mention here that there are very interesting cultural differences. In Italy, it's the one country in Europe where blue is the most effective in placebo pills, and apparently it's because the colour of the, of the national uh, football team is blue um, in, in Italy, and, uh, and so apparently it makes that a powerful colour. But in general, you, know, you want to have all the trappings of authority and sophistication and so on associated with whatever medicine is being administered. And so you know, if, um, when I was being injected in my neck, if I hadn't been told it was dangerous and if it patently didn't involve, you know, scanning machinery and nurses in white coats and so on, I probably wouldn't have got better. Um, so you can't, you can't, you can't uh, simply uh, uh, short, take a shortcut here. The, whatever the hospital authorities are doing, they need not only to believe themselves, but have, have the psychological apparatus in place to persuade the patients that it's going to work. But of course, there are other, other much simpler things they can do, like uh, opening their windows and so on. And those have actually had 
been shown to be very important influences, as I said. Um, the art on the walls can make a difference. I mean, again, it's astonishing that people have only just begun to realize that. But, but here's something interesting to think about. Um, uh, my wife had cancer last year and was having a long series of chemotherapy. She's completely better now. I'd never been in a cancer ward before. Um, and it was an extraordinary experience. I don't, I'm not sure some of you have. You are surrounded by sick people. You're surrounded by doctors and apparatus and everything else. That all gives a very strong, good signal. You're also surrounded by an awful lot of really sick people. So a cancer ward is giving you really contrary signals. It's telling you you're really ill, but what else, what else are you doing there? It's also telling you that um, you're, you're, you're in good hands. Uh, but I think if people were more interested in the psychology and, and the effects on health, they might be begin to think about the actual risks of making it so obvious to every other patient on the ward that, uh, that, that you know, the person in the next bed who's only two weeks further on than they are has lost all their hair or is looking uh, thin or whatever it may be. Maybe home treatment, um, which we already know is a good thing, is a very good thing precisely because it doesn't expose you to the lesson that you're, uh, you're in a place where people die. Um, you know, if you can die because your name is wrong, um, imagine what, you're, what, what happens when you're in cancer ward. <laughs> So I mean, there are a lot of things to think about. I'm not a doctor, but I, um, uh, and the medical establishment don't, on the whole, want to listen to people like, like us anyway. But um, nonetheless, what's important is to persuade them that they thought of this. Um, and so they'll come up with these solutions themselves. Yeah, I would like to connect to yesterday's lecture. And you made a, a sharp distinction. I like it between phenomenal... Uh, consciousness and, so to speak, what we are unconscious of, brain states, rest of the body, and so on. Now, today you have not mentioned this distinction at all. Would you, could you please connect? Huh. Um, I, some, in, in some ways, I don't think I, I do, do see an obvious way of connecting, connecting those. I think a lot of these influences are actually unconscious. Um, the way we... You know, when we respond, let's say, to a sick face, for example, I don't... Um, well, I'll give you an example where we know it's unconscious um, because <coughs> patients won't comment on it. Some of you may know the research on so-called terror management theory. Um, do you? Uh, oh, OK, well, this is it's very significant in social psychology nowadays. People have discovered that if you remind people of death, you dramatically change their, uh, their attitudes to uh, politics and... Uh, and uh, their morals and, uh, and outgroups and the rest of it. Um, if you, uh, it's classically, it's done by, you know, you get people to write a little essay about what's going to happen to them after they die, for example, and then you test them on their attitudes towards uh, a minority group, or you test them on the how harsh they'll be on criminals, for example. Um, judges in this one experiment were exposed to a mortality salience induction and then asked to issue uh, a, a, a punishment for prostitutes in, in San Francisco. Um, it was four times as steep if they'd been reminded of death before they issued the, um, uh, uh, the then they came out with, the, with their judgments. Um, these are big effects again. In that case, of course, they, they were, were writing about death and of course they, so they thought about it. Um, it's been, there now a lot of work has been done which has shown that even if you expose people to mortality relevant um, uh, stimuli, even if they don't acknowledge them, it still works. And uh, a study now repeated all over the world is that if you interview people within a few uh, tens of meters of a funeral home in the street, uh, a, a funeral parlor, it's called in America, you know what I mean, undertaker. <laughs> um, and then you ask them their attitudes towards uh, abortion or towards creationism or whatever it may be, you find that people become much, much more conservative um, in when they're close to a funeral home, even though when you ask them afterwards, they apparently hadn't even realised it. Um, and uh, this is, this, as I said, this is an experiment that's been widely repeated now. So unconscious reminders of death can change people's personality and their politics, for that matter. Um, so I suspect exactly you know, that that's a case where it's, it, 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 the results stand out. But a lot of the things I'm talking about, I'm sure, are occurring at an unconscious level. And if we take the case, let's say, of the 
you know, the hamsters, um, they don't think it's winter or think it's summer or whatever. It's actually, it's an, at a, an another level of their brain they're taking in information. Um, so to come back to your point about my talk yesterday, I, uh, it's relevant only in the sense that, I, that uh, um, I was arguing yesterday for how phen phenomenology and the, uh, and the uh, excitement that generates about our sense of purpose and, and, our, uh, and the, the glories of the world we live in gives us an individual boost. It makes us more, more self-important and raises our self-esteem. Um, I'm sure that has health effects too. Um, but uh, it, it, I mean, that's only because it is having these effects directly on, on what we think about the outlook and the future. Just, I'll just do uh, shortly uh, an anecdote uh, concerning the ladies or the uh, question about this uh, cost and benefit aspects. For many years ago, let's say more than 20 years ago, I tried to, in my department of neurology to uh, see up on those uh, medicines which were not as expensive as nowadays, gabapentin and pregabalin and duloxetin, you know, lots of medicines which are doing very good uh, effect not concerning the nociceptive pain, but the, neuro uh, so the neurogenic pain mm -hmm. and all that. Well, without going into that details, the fact is that I'm convinced, and we were many upon that, but it, there was the ethic aspects of the whole thing. We wanted just to start our patients with all those gabapentin and whatever very, very, very expensive medicines were. And they were given effect, but the thing is that the the time of elimination is increasing as, uh, by, uh, by the time being. So we were convinced that it was the more expensive, the most expensive placebo medicine we were giving our patients. Mm -hmm. Everybody was aware about that. Even it was uh, anti-epileptics as well. So mm -hmm. the thing is that there maybe it's time for young youngsters or younger colleagues to start that again. That to, to be frankly uh, honest with oneself and say, well, the placebo effect is starting something when you are convinced that the, medis, the, the, the true substance is helping, mm. let's say, one month, and then go on with the placebo imitation. Yes. That's been suggested, actually, yeah. that you, you, you simply just That's move right. off. That will be the, most, uh, yes. the, that will be the solution for yes. sparing money, because the patient won't know. It will be a kind of, you are not cheating with the patient, mm. and the patient, uh, because I, I, I confirmed that uh, uh, theory by just having the patient call me, calling me a Friday evening, my medicine is, is gone, or I, I don't find it, or whatever, or mm -hmm. it, it, it's, it's uh, empty and all that. So they were paining. So the, that, uh, that placebo effect which they were having through all those months, just uh, uh, the, the cognition, the, the reality was yeah. there that I don't have medicine, I'll, I'll go, I'll therefore go, I'm return. paining. Yeah, absolutely. You see? So I think that that is a, a very, very good way of yes. saving lots of money. I, I won't tell you a million of, of uh, mm -hmm. Swedish crowns, but just being careful with that, that mm -hmm. keeping from the very true substance to change it to placebo. Mm. Since, you're, since, you're a, a, yeah. you're, since you're a doctor, I'll just mention one other very interesting thing. Thank you facts the research has shown is that the, the, the manner, the bedside manner, the style of doctors is uh, hugely important and different doctors, are, some are just really are much better at administering placebos than others are. And there's been research done over 25 years in which a group of doctors were compared to begin with, they all administered the same placebo and the results were measured. Uh, then it was done longitudinally over 25 years. The ones who were best at the beginning were still best 25 years later. Um, so um, uh, we, we don't know enough about quite what this is about, um, but it's, there clearly are very important aspects of character and authority and so on, which uh, uh, allow doctors to communicate the right message in some cases and not in others. Um, it may be a reason why, you know, Literally in medical school, there ought to be a kind of triage in which some of them end up as anaesthetists who don't have to interact with their patients <laughs> and others end up actually on the, uh, on the, uh, on the, um, the counselling or whatever it might be. <coughs> I mean, not everybody is going to be good at the same thing. In your department, you must have come across this new move towards philosophy therapy. Um, 
there's some, there's some evidence, ph philosophers, at least some of them, are rather good at, uh, at, at, at counselling and, at, and persuading uh, patients that they're going to be okay. You, um, I, I think the, the issue of, of what is and isn't adaptive is, is even more difficult than you're suggesting. Mm -hmm. So you talked about severe or clinical depression being not at all adaptive. Um, and it seems to me that isn't necessarily true. Um, so, uh, okay, you have um, at least some cases of severe or clinical depression where there's uh, a clear environmental trigger at some point in the past and uh, what appears to be an initially adaptive strategy which becomes maladaptive mm -hmm. later. Um, but also, um, uh, with long-term depression, people, it's well known that people respond very differently to even severe depression. Um, so uh, some people, uh, some artists, uh, are intensely creative, uh, apparently s uh, precisely out of uh, their severe depression. Well, so it, it seems to yes, me... Yes, I, I mean, bipolar disorder is certainly associated with creativity, and uh, um, I think we probably would want a different analysis of that, where people are moving between different kinds of states of either mania or depression distinguish that from severe chronic depression, which you know, somebody basically is out of this world and unable to look after themselves, and it's permanent. I mean, that's clearly, you know, that's, that can't be a good thing. But I would agree, it's, it's not going to be a clear cut, and no doubt the same uh, brain mechanisms are involved in, 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 in along a continuum there. But even with people who aren't bipolar, there mm -hmm. are different responses that people have to long-term depression, and even the same person at different points in time mm. and can respond very differently to it, so. Yeah, um, yes, I agree. Um, it's, uh, I mean, and, and now the evolutionary psychologists are coming up with adaptive explanations of almost any uh, aspect of human behavior which has a strong heritable basis. And since most mental illness does, um, there must be some, or it would seem there must be some advantage to being having some of these illnesses at least in mild form. It may be that you just want to have one gene for it rather than both, uh, and it's only when, you're, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you get it from both sides that perhaps you're going to be in trouble. That could, you know, certainly Jeffrey Miller's argued about schizophrenia, that schizotype personalities are highly creative and, and, and also born leaders of communities and so on. Um, and so having those schizo schizoid genes in the population can be adaptive. Um, but uh, almost always, though, that you know, whatever we're talking about, there are going to be costs as well as benefits. And I, I think what's, again, we've increasingly realized about the way in which our, our, our nature, our genes interact with the environment we find us, find us in, that, that we, we have been designed to be highly responsive to environmental cues and to either dampen down a particular aspect of personality or physiology in one situation or, or, or boost it in another directly in response to the environment, which is a reason why you know, the old nature-nurture argument is, is becoming a silly one now because na our, it's our nature to respond to the environment in adaptive ways. Mm. But I take that's a good point. Yeah, uh, first of all, I think maybe the solution to Victoria's uh, question or the dilemma for the board should be to, to introduce some sort of double-blind placebo where the board just secretly replaces uh, the expensive drugs with placebos without telling the doctors. Um, so they could save some money and the doctors would still behave as they, us they yeah. usually do. Um, one of the things that I uh, thought peculiar was that when... Um, that, that you see a decrease in, um, in the immune system if, uh, well, uh, well, you see an in increase in, um, in symptoms if you see that, uh, that your injury is bad and, and you see a, a, a decrease in the, um, in the recoverability on the, on the cancer awards so or it's negative to see uh, really sick people around you. Uh, because I would have expected uh, some sort of uh, unconscious reaction uh, of the acknowledgement that, oh, this is really serious, I should really well, kick in the immune system. Well, it can work both, if, both ways. If you're already sick, it's when then, seeing, uh, being, then, then threats seem to make you then dampen your immune response because it's as if uh, at that point uh, you, 
you, do, you, don't, you won't take the risk. If you're not sick, you get an increase in immune response to ward off infection or the beginning of an, a new illness. Um, in the case of you know, the, the, the hamsters who hold on to their immune resources when they think that it's, the conditions are bad, it's winter, for example, that's when they've already been infected with, 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 with bacteria. Um, it's so, you know, the costs and benefits are going to be very finely balanced depending on, in some cases, yes, you ought, if it, it, sometimes it's going to be the best strategy to go for all your worth to get out of this situation, to get better, to remove yourself. In other cases, you've already gone too far and you can't do that at that point. Um, but, um, in, I mean, this, 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 I said there's a new field of, 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 um, of um, ecological or evolutionary immunity, um, but it's a very uh, young field at the moment and people haven't even begun to address the real, I mean, to model it in real cost-benefit economic terms, which is what they will need to do. Mm. I mean, I agree. The point problem is the site at the moment that, that I and probably, probably anyone else working and thinking on these lines can, can explain whatever is the case because it can be adaptive or not to go this way if that's the way it went or the other way if, it's, if that's what we found. So I agree this it would be a good criticism. We can't always predict what would happen. <coughs> Well, I mean, it, you know, as I said, people finish a race with a lot of reserves of, in, their, in their muscles, um, even though they're totally s exhausted. It's quite clear that uh, people die of cancer when, in fact, their immune system had a lot more reserves, which for some reason they've held back. Now, that is clearly a bad strategy. If you're, once you're dead, it's not going to be any use to you to have it. Um, it may just be the price we pay for a rather inefficient design. I mean, uh, we've been we've evolved to, to take... You know, to to, to just do a kind of Bayesian analysis of what's likely to happen um, and make, make a forecast. In some cases, that forecast is, is going to uh, uh, go wrong and, and, and lead us into trouble, and, and the worst trouble of all if we actually do fail to, take to, to use our resources when we're going to be dead next day. I mean, but it happens with the, with the drivers of these Mercedes-Benz cars, or it did until they put the brake assist in. <coughs> Thank you very much again, and we look forward to tomorrow's lecture. Okay.